Hey, welcome to How the F*** Was That a Hit? And I'm here, David Quintana, and I'm here with my co-host, Tim Foster. Hi, David. Uh, Tim is the real-life musician. I'm just a cultural observer. And what we like to do here is we like to take hits uh, that people often will go, how the f- was that a hit? And in this, in this case, that's a fair question. <laughs> there are some people that hate this song, man. We're going to go to 1985. And in 1985, what was going on in the world? Reagan and Gorbachev had their first meeting. Um, let me see. Dwight Gooden won his Cy Young Award at the age of, uh, at the age of 20. Number one TV show was The Cosby Show. Maybe we shouldn't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> we might get bleeped on that one. We might get age age uh, bracketed on that one. Yeah. Kelly Cuoco with The Big Bang Theory was born um, in I've 1985. Never, I've never even heard of Kelly Cuoco. Sorry, November, Kelly. I'm sorry, November of night. We're all talking November of 1985 here. Um, and Microsoft Windows 1.0 was dropped. Whoa. All in November of 1985. Um, the top 10 was pretty lame. In addition to this song, the top 10 was really, really, really forgettable. You had You Belong to You Belong to the City by Glenn Fry. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think anyone these days, you know, really remembers that. That's the kind of song that only plays. Glenn Fry's mom loves that song. <laughs> yeah, right, his accountant. Well, probably not, because I don't think it's played enough. A Miami Vice theme, uh-huh. that, that was like number three. That was everywhere. Everywhere. Um, Head Over Heels by Tears for Fears. Not even the best Tears for Fears song. Yeah. Um, uh, what about Part-Time Lover by Stevie Wonder. Again, probably on the way low ranking of Stevie Wonder hits. Oh, Broken Wings by Mr. Mister was number seven. That was everywhere. That, I remember that song. I was not fondly, but I do remember that was a song that was really got a lot of play on the old K108 FM here in Sacramento. Yeah, it was just, it was bad. It was a bad. It was a bad time for music. Well, in fact, I have got two of them I didn't even mention. Number six was Phil Collins. Uh, um, which one? Which was um, oh, Separate Lives, which I don't even remember, frankly. No, no. Well, we'll, we'll play it for you. Yeah, Separate Lives, um, which was again eminently forgettable. And number eight was Never by Heart. So what they did was they took guys or women, they took folks that were really good at one time, Stevie Wonder, and they just put them through a ringer and got the most saccharine, forgettable type of music out of them. Part-Time Lover by Stevie Wonder. If you did a time capsule with Stevie Wonder, Part-Time Lover would not be the one going in there. If you did a time capsule with Heart, you'd put like Barracuda, right? You would not put Never. If you did a time capsule with Phil Collins, right? You wouldn't put separate. You don't even remember separate lives. No. You Susudio goes way above separate yeah, lives, right? I mean, it was just it was. Uh, you belong to the city. They took the guy that did some genius stuff with the Eagles, and they turned him into "You Belong to the City." So the number one song was "We Built This City" by Starship. Right. Let's not get, not Jefferson. Starship. No, let's dig into that a little bit. Yeah. So "We Built This City" was by the group. Starship, which interestingly enough had two lead singers, uh, Mickey Thomas, right, who is not Elvin Bishop, a little, <laughs> who people think is Elvin Bishop because yeah. he sang the lead on a great song called "Fooled Around and Fell in Love." Elvin Bishop was a guitarist. Mickey Thomas, who at that time was a young guy, right. he sang he sang the lead vocals. Um, but he had joined Starship, or he had joined Jefferson Starship because Grace Slick had retired for a little bit or walked away or. She was mercurial, so yeah. who knows why she left. So Starship is the last iteration of what had begun in the late 60s as Jefferson Airplane. Actually, it started in the mid-60s as Jefferson Airplane before there was even a Grace Slick. I mean, Grace Slick was in another band. And they uh, Jefferson Airplane were really never all that commercially successful. I mean, they did have they some weren't. success. But Two in, yeah, when early 60s, they were very well respected by all the other groups in San Francisco. They were a San Francisco band. You know, they were kind of uh, helped put together what became the Summer of Love and that whole hate Ashbury hippie vibe. They were a big part of that. And they were a band of kind of eclectic, beatniky, hippie, proto hippie kind of people. And they put together one record, which came out under the name Jefferson Airplane. They didn't really have any hits out of that, but they were respected by their colleagues. And they had a singer named Signe Anderson who was a, a female singer, 
And she got pregnant and decided that she wanted to step away from the band. And so they got a new singer who had been in a a local band called The Great Society named Grace Slick. And Grace Slick came to the band. Uh, Jefferson Airplane were more successful than The Great Society. And she also brought two songs that had been written and performed and even released by The Great Society, but hadn't really not gone anywhere. And those songs, White Rabbit and Somebody to Love, became huge hits for Jefferson Airplane in the context of things. They're only two hits. Yeah, they were, but they were very successful. But so Grace Slick and Paul Kantner and the other members, there was actually a fairly large band. I think there might have been six, seven people at one point. They had their successes. And then in the early 70s, really, that was starting to fracture. They did not have follow-up hits to Somebody to Love and White Rabbit. They just... You know, they had songs that came out were somewhat successful. I think their LPs sold okay, but certainly not to the degree that they were hoping. And so they needed a change, and they became Jefferson's Starship. Yeah. 74. Yeah, and several of the earlier members Mm -hmm. of the Jefferson Airplane, some of the more arty members, left. And ultimately, when Paul Kantner, who had been an early member of the Jefferson Airplane, was there before Gray Slick, he left. And at that point... There was no original Jefferson Airplane members, like earlier members of Jefferson Airplane left. And so he asked that they not use, well, asked, probably his lawyer asked, (laughs) that they not use the Jefferson Starship name anymore. So they just became Starship. Mm -hmm. And that group was more driven, I think, by Grace Slick herself. She was really, seemed like she was functioning as the band leader. Now, now they were actually very successful as Jefferson Starship. They had eight gold and platinum albums. They had a a number of top 10 hits. Um, I, I forget. Yeah, but they, yeah, they had eight top forty hits. Yeah, they were so Jefferson and Starship were much more popular. Marty Ballin, Paul Kantner. Yeah, yeah, they were they were very successful. Um, they were a top touring act in the United States for most of the seventies into the early eighties. So in 1985, they found themselves kind of, I think, you know, entering that nostalgia band. Um, you know, they were very close to being a nostalgia band because yeah. they hadn't had a hit at well, Starship. And, and how old? I mean, at that point, I think she Grace was forty seven. Yeah. So she was old, right? She should, she could have already retired. And they were kind of just, I think, looking for something. I think they were, the label was about to, about to let them go because what do you do? I mean, they're, your lead singer's 47. You know, the Woodstock is a long time away. I think everyone perceived Jefferson Starship as being run by like, you know, Kantner and, and right. Marty Ballin and those yeah. guys. So you really got a couple lead singers and a band that no one, you know, it's kind of losing its relevance. They're kind of wandering around. I think the label is like, what do we do with these guys? Well, they're trying to do something with them. So they decided, well, hey, we got this Bernie Toppin, who was, you know, the lyricist behind all of the Elton John catalog. Um, and he was retired. He was out by a pool. Right. And the label's like, we got to get Bernie Toppin. Why don't we get Bernie, have him do some stuff, then we can give it to Starship. And maybe that'll work, right? Because Bernie has had, again, you know, uh, more hits than you can count. There was a young songwriter by the name of Martin Page, uh, right? And they were like Martin Page had a had a weird group. Um, he he saw himself as a he new like wave a, guy. Yeah, new wave band. Yeah. He was like new wave, right? He was like Wang Chung. Like <laughs> he wasn't Wang Chung, but that type of at that era, how they sounded very different, right? Yeah. And they would just do weird shit because it was new age. Yeah. So, but Martin Page had done some work. He he was kind of like the young up and coming guy, but he was new. Yeah. So but he had played the he had played the uh keyboards on Ghostbusters by Ray Parker Jr. Wow. Yeah, he was a keyboardist and he had done work with Earth Wind and Fire, Kim Carnes, Barbara oh. Streisand. So they put him with Bernie Toppin. And so they decided and Bernie told him, "Yeah, I've heard of you," you know, which surprised Martin Page. He's like, "Hey, what the hell? You've heard of me?" Um, and so they put together a couple of songs. Bernie had a couple of songs mm-hmm. and he gave them to Paige and then, you know, Paige never, you know, they, they kind of worked as Elton and Bernie did. I guess that's Bernie Toppin style. Hmm. Like he does his thing and he sends it to you and then you do your thing. So Bernie yeah. had a couple of songs. He sent them to Martin Page and the two songs were this song, We Built This City. Mm-hmm. And the other song was These Dreams by Heart, which also became a number one hit wow. in 1986. So those were the two. I mean, it's not bad for Bernie, right? Two for two there. Even better for Martin Martin Page. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. right. Um, And so he took took the song uh, Bernie Toppin did. Now, so Bernie Toppin initially did this song 
um, as a uh, it's kind of an ode to the live music scene dying in Los Angeles because it was the mid '80s, right? So yeah. music was changing, right? As you said, the corporatization. Well, and so, if you listen to the original, I think I, we, you've heard the demo. Yeah, right? there's a demos on. If you look on YouTube, you'll find yeah. the Hages demo. <laughs> By Bernie were rather dark-ish. Page added his new wave touch to them, so it made him a little more upbeat, yeah. right? And so I think a little bit of the meaning was getting lost by the time Page got a hold of them yeah. because he wanted to put his new wave spin on it. And it's, you know, it's hard to do a. When I read that, a dirge. Bernie Chapman really tries to sell this as like, oh, this was actually a kind of a down song, right? Right. He, he says and that. I will tell you, if you listen to the demo, the demo sounds basically like the demo for We Built the City. It is very familiar. It doesn't sound like, how did they turn this song into this other song? It sounds very much like kind of a stripped down lo-fi version of We Built the City. So I I don't hear what Bernie Taupin is talking about. Now, maybe when he was sitting there singing it to himself, he was like, We Built the City. I just have no idea. It, It does not sound that dramatically different to me. It's it's way less produced, but it's yeah. still recognizably the same song. Yeah, I mean, and that's the, it's kind of like texting, right? When you text, it's always hard to tell what the person means. And yeah. in this case, Bernie's a lyricist, yeah. right? And so, I don't know, you write in fancy cursive? Yeah. You write in block letters to make it like more depressing? I don't know. So, yeah, but Martin Page took it, added yeah. his new wave touch to it. Okay. And so he put a police scanner in there to to kind of show how edgy it was and depressing the city, you know. The, it's like RoboCop here. Right, exactly. <laughs> it was like RoboCop, right? This is what L.A. is becoming. They sent it to Starship, sorry. And according to Mickey Thomas, like, Mickey loved it. He was like, ah, this is good. I like this. You know, it's got a good beat. I, I, I see what they're going for here. And Peter Wolf, not the Peter. I was going to say. Not the Peter Wolf from Jay Giles' band. Yeah. I like to kind of imagine if Jay Giles would have, you know, yeah. the Peter Wolf from Jay Giles' band would have produced this record. It would have been a very different record. Peter Wolf, Peter Wolf is actually from Germany. Yeah. And um, he was he was a very hot producer, but this was at the very, very, very beginning of his very hotness. Um, he later went on to produce like Sarah, which was a number one hit for them. Yeah. Um, Who's Johnny for DeBarge? Everybody Wang Chung tonight, speaking of Wang Chung. So he became a really hot producer, right? He really owned that 85 through 87 area era. Yeah. Um, but he was the producer, right, that the label gave it to to kind of pump it up. Right. And he made it even more upbeat. He made it an even more upbeat song, and I think he got it to about 90% mm. of what we hear today. And that was that was Peter Wolf. And Peter Wolf was a keyboard player. So I think you hear a synth guy, and so I think you hear a lot of him in there. Hmm. Um, and so that's kind of how the song is starting to to take shape. Yeah. What do you think of the music um, in there as, I, as the music comes? You know, you really can't talk about this, huh? Because you just hate it so much. Well, I, the thing is, I, I, one of the things is going back and now in 1985, this song was inescapable. Having, you know, been alive in 1985, I was still listening to the radio a bit at that point. This song was wallpaper. It was everywhere. And even at the time, I didn't really understand why, because it's not that well played. It's not that well sung. And really, it's not that much of a song. Like, as far as the songwriting goes, whatever Bernie Taupin's bona fides are as a songwriter, uh, you wouldn't get it from reading the lyrics to this. And musically, it's not that interesting. Like, Honestly, aside from the chorus, I don't know that I could even hum this song because it's just not that memorable to me. But for whatever reason, it resonated with people. And and then there's this also thing. We built this city on rock and roll, which ostensibly Bernie Taupin wrote this about Los Angeles, which is ridiculous because Los Angeles was not built on rock and roll. You know, I mean, I guess you could arguably make that – yeah, like the birds. You, you can make right, that. The eagles. But I mean, there was L.A. was already Hollywood and L.A. Yeah, 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 way true. before Elvis Presley even stepped in front of a microphone. Like you know what I mean? We built the city on makeup. Yeah, exactly. We yeah. built the city on like you yeah. know Hollywood. Clegg lights. Uh, but I think, to their credit, 
Starship recognized you could kind of make that argument about San Francisco because San Francisco was so tight with Bill Graham. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm, yeah, he was the point. big, pro- he was a nationally known music promoter. You had the Summer of Love. You had Hate Ashbury. You had uh, Altamont, which was, you know, maybe not a positive thing, but certainly a big thing. And you had all of these bands. I mean, uh, Creedence Clearwater, not San Francisco proper, but Bay Area. You could make the argument that really San Francisco was perceived as a, as a city that came into its own based on its rock and roll history. And I think they recognize that. And maybe even though Taupin says he wrote it about LA, maybe in the back of his head, if he knew he was writing it for Starship, he was thinking about that. And then also they later had the DJ come in and do his little DJ overdub. Mm -hmm. And he did say the city by the bay. Mm -hmm. Looking out over that Golden Gate Bridge on another gorgeous sunny Saturday. I'm seeing that bumper to bumper traffic. Favorite radio station in your favorite radio city, the city by the bay, the city that rocks the city. So, I mean, he was acknowledging San Francisco. So I think there was that, and there was sort of this, 85 was was 18 years after the city, the summer of love, but people were starting to get back into that stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, you remember the Grateful Dead had, I mean, they had broken up, but they were pretty, they were lying fallow, you know, you could say. And then all of a sudden they come out and a few years later, they have a huge hit, Touch of Grey and stuff. So I think it was that nostalgia for the summer of love and for the late 60s, it was coming up, and this was warming that territory, I think. I think that's a big part of why, yeah, yeah, I think the nostalgia was the biggest part of this song, was people going, look, oh, it's Grace Slick, and look at her singing and all this yeah. stuff, you know? Well, I, I think there are, I have two real reasons that I want to get to why I think yeah. this was good, and it goes into the making of the song, too, which we can finish out with this, and yeah. that is, in the making of the song, um, we're talking about 85, so 85 was kind of the leading edge of the end of the AM radio DJ. Um, we grew up, people, you know, over the age of 50 grew up maybe like over the age of 40. They grew up with um, AM radio DJs. And one of the things that they would do is they would love to get that song to start right after they, you had to have a song that had a dramatic beginning mm-hmm. because a DJ, and I was a DJ for in high school, so I used to love that. So you would finish what you were saying and then immediately the song would start. And so you would love to have a song that had a great beginning. And so you could say, you know, and it's 45 degrees outside, you're listening to KFLY, boom. And then the the music does something, yeah. right? Showtime, six o'clock with the bad boy, Betty Martinez, a KIIS, Los Angeles. Hot hits, kiss, Los Angeles. Yeah, that's the world. The AM DJ, you had to have that hard beginning with that music. So when this song came out, right, it started off with the instruments. Peter Wolf had produced it like that. It went to an engineer by the name of Bill Bottrell. Bill Bottrell produced, he engineered everybody. He's an engineer mixer. He did bad. He did all of Michael Jackson stuff. He did all Sheryl Crow's stuff. He did Tom Petty's stuff. But again, he was at the beginning of his career here as a younger guy. And Bill Bottrell was the engineer for... Um, the, the Hoopla album by Starship. They gave, to, they gave it to, they gave the song to Betrell, and what he did was he lifted the We Built This City, and he made he lifted the lyrics, or he lifted the verse, mm-hmm. and he put it at the beginning as an acapella. We built this city. We built this city on rock and roll. We built this city. We built this city on rock. So when you listen to We Built This City, it starts off with an acapella verse, right? And with that echo effect. Yeah. He did that. They didn't do that on purpose. And in fact, when they first heard the single, they were like, oh, that's cool. What's that? I think that was a big part of why this became a hit yeah. because I think it was good for the for the DJs, right? An AM DJ, it's 59 and, you know, you're listening to KF, well, KFQQ, we built this city. It was a perfect well, lead also, in. It was like a perfect radio song. We built the city on rock and roll, which, you know, there was this whole, like, the sort of the boomer generation, they were obsessed with this rock and roll music, probably more in some ways than any other generation, really. And so the idea that rock and roll was so central to the existence that it built this city, that plays right into that whole mythos. So it goes, and it also goes into the exact same people who were 
going to get work as radio DJs. <laughs> like, right. They bought right into it. So the second part of it was um, I told you about the radio scanner, the police scanner right. that that uh, Martin Page had put in there because he was such a, you know, such a cool new wave guy. Well, he did that. Um, but in the production, right, they left it in there and they were actually going to use it as a uh, guitar solo. They're like, oh, that's cool. The radio scanner would get it. Ha ha. Great. But let's just put a guitar solo over it as a bridge. Shout out to Sacramento here. Craig Chiquiso, the guitar player for Starship, is from Sacramento, Sacramento native. And, uh, you know, when I was in high school in that area, he was a little bit of a point of pride that he come right out of here and went and hit the biggest big time there is. The no. most hated song of all time. Yeah. Sacramento guitar player. <laughs> there you go. Shout out. Um, so the second brilliant thing, uh, I hope, man, it would be great if Craig would uh, would listen. Um <laughs> So uh, the second biggest thing that they did was in addition uh, – that I feel that they did to really make this thing pop in addition to the nostalgia factor. Because remember, those hippies were now in their late 30s. Exactly. They had a lot of spending power. They're watching power. 30-something. Right. Yeah, right. And so um, – but uh, that police scanner, they decided to make it a guitar solo. But then they go, well, you know what? No, why don't we do this? I got this friend, Les Garland. He's yep. a friend of the band. Right, and um, he was a DJ in San Francisco. Why don't we just get him to do a DJ thing instead of a police scanner? And so they got, if you listen to the radio for like 20, 30 seconds, you hear a guy doing his DJ thing. Exactly. Looking over the Bay Bridge and, right, doing all that. Yeah. That was smart. The city that never sleeps. Yeah. <laughs> right. Your favorite radio station, your favorite radio city, the city by the bay, the city that rocks, the city that never sleeps. Their manager, a guy by the name of Bill Thompson, said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I got an even better idea. We'll put that on the album, but then we're going to give singles to all the different radio stations and let them put their own DJs in there. So now that was I got to say, like that right there was the thing that probably made this the biggest hit. Right? That's there. what. That's what I think. I think that was yeah. freaking brilliant. It is. I think that's what made it number one. You're because right. you're, if you're KFRC in San Francisco and you can have your DJ, I don't know, Doctor Don Rose now yeah. do a thirty second bit in the middle. You know, of course, Doctor Don wants to play that because he wants to hear himself jamming with the Starship. Taking notes. I'm going to do this on my next record, <laughs> right? Because all AM DJs are nerds, um, and so they all want to, you know, hang out with the hot. But the hot chick, Grace Slick, um, or whoever, right? Yeah. That one hang out with the cool kids. Yeah. And so I think that that move by their manager, Bill Thompson, was brilliant. So you combine that with the um, with that beautiful lead in for the AM DJs, right? And we st- AM DJs are still hot now. FM, but I got to say, eighty five FM was huge, and they still had DJs on FM at this point. So they did the same thing. Yeah, they did the same thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's just we associated with the AM guys. Sure. And then plus you got the nostalgia. So you got all these late 30 people who were Woodstock people, remember Jefferson Airplane. Exactly. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's my group. And they're probably buying it to play for their kids, right? Yeah, this is who we jammed to in the 60s. So I think all of that played into this. Yeah. And you know how the earworm effect is. Once you hear a song so many times, exactly, yeah. it just worms its way into your head. Yeah. And one, I will say the – the We Built the City part is a hook. I mean, I don't particularly care for it, but I can't argue with the fact that it's a good hook. The rest of the, the verse parts, I can't even, honestly, I can't even remember. If you put a gun to my head and said, hum those for me right now, I'd be hard-pressed to do it because they're just sort of forgettable. But but a hook is hook, and, yeah. and that does stick in your head. And it also, well, let's not forget, it also came at kind of the birth of the ra- the video. Yeah. Right, so it came on MTV. It was on heavy rotation on MTV. Yeah, um, they had they spent a lot of. It was a major label, so they spent a lot of money on making a good video. So you get that too to get the younger kids, right? So I think you add all of that together. Plus, you got like a great producer, a hot producer, right? You got a great sound guy mixer who is bright enough to throw that acapella thing in the beginning. I think you know they had a lot of the team working for him here to make this a, a number well, one. So what's funny is that you know our our theme on this show is always to look at a song that either was was a number one, but you figure out like, what's the backstory, the weird backstory that got it there? Or this is really a terrible song. How did it become <laughs> such a huge hit? In that case, I think this song is that it's very funny that this song has really faced a backlash that it was, you know, it was ad nauseum was everywhere. And then I don't know how long ago it was like 15 or 20 years ago, it started winning all these polls for the worst song of all time. Mm-hmm. And the funny part is 
No one questioned it. Not like there was an argument like, oh, no. It was kind of like, oh, yeah, that really was the worst song of all time. Yeah. You know, and even the band members now. Grace Slick doesn't even want to talk about the song. Yeah. Well, she, Grace Slick claims that she went to the producer and said, I need a song. I want to make a lot of money and retire. So do that. Yeah. That's her. You she's know, pretty honest about it. Yeah, well, she's the other band members have that. Uh, the lead singer says, oh, I don't remember it that way. But um, so for me, I'm going to take a little bit of a. You know, speaking of the band, so the bass player, they interviewed the bass player on this, Pete Sears, and he said, I joined Jefferson Starship. I joined a band full of artists, musical artists who had been really creative. They'd come out of the summer of love. They were doing this stuff, and then they all left. <laughs> but I had kids to feed, and I had bills to pay. <laughs> so I stayed in Starship, and they bring this, and I think he refers to it as a piece of shit in, and I gritted my teeth. And I played the bass, and I paid my kids' bills, and, you know, and that's what I did. So so Starship went on. I mean, this was really the most successful iteration of that group ever. Um, this song, they also hit number one with Sarah. They had a couple of other. Uh, they also hit number one, ne Never Gonna Stop Us, uh, which was in the, uh, or Nothing's Gonna Stop Us, which was in the movie Mannequin. Hmm. And that went to number one. So they had a great, great, like, uh, Indian summer Right. And yeah. then uh, Grace Slick made her money as she said she wanted to, and she cashed out. Now, the father of the child, Bernie Toppin, continues to deny it. Um, mm -hmm. He's like a chef who's like, hey, man, I told him not to put that much pepper in the stew. Yeah. Oh, no, that's not me, man. I gave him a great recipe. They effed it up. Yeah. So that's Bernie Toppin. Um, I, Martin Page seems to like whatever, man. I like the song. Yeah, yeah I think he's, no I, he's with fine it. with it. <laughs> yeah. Again, he's he's signing the back of the check. So he's just fine. <laughs> yeah, he's good. Um, Peter Wolf, he doesn't talk a lot, but he had a great career. You know, what's funny though is that the other song that people talk about as the number two worst of all time is usually Wang Chung's "Everybody Wang Chung Tonight." Really? Yeah. Another See, Peter Wolf production. You can't be that horrible of a song if people still remember you 35 years later. Oh, yeah, you can. Oh, oh yes. no, I disagree. <laughs> it could be a horrible, horrible no. song. Okay, well, we agree to disagree on that one. I think just the fact that we're still talking about them 35 years later, there's some True. merit there. Well, know? and I will say, so you're talking about, so do, you think it do you think it deserved to be a hit? I do think it deserved to be a hit, um, given all of the industry push behind it, given the producers, given, I think, two brilliant moves by the manager and by the engineer yeah. for that period of time on the radio. Um, I don't think it deserved musically to be a hit, yeah. but I think that um, the machine behind it, it deserved to be a hit. Yeah, and I got, you know, it's funny, as we've been talking about this, I didn't really realize that they had done that thing where they left a blank. I knew that that had happened, but I thought that was an after the fact. I didn't realize that was kind of, mm -hmm. you know, baked into the cake. And that actually had been done before. But I know in the 50s, I think, I think it was called like, I'm not sure the title on this, but I think it was called like High School USA. And it was basically like a song about your high school, like, you know, perky kind of rock and roll song in the probably late 50s, early 60s. Sounded kind of like the Beach Boys a little bit. And it's like singing about your song. And then there was a blank Base. And they would, uh, they recorded the different high schools and they had a different version. Wherever you were from, you would buy the version about your high school. And that did not become a hit. I mean, it was successful enough, but it wasn't a big hit. But uh, so it had been done before, that idea had been done before. Yeah. In, in 1978, the Pointer Sisters had a song called Fire. And the big song, the big radio station in this area at that time was an AM station called KFRC. Mm -hmm. And, um, they, there, was a ver there was a verse in that song where it says, turn on the radio, right? That's what the major, that's what the primary hit was. But they allowed cities to go turn on KFRC or oh. take, turn on KSFO. Um, so they had kind of that deal. That was a big hit for the Pointer Sisters in 78. So it had mm. been done before, but but the way they did it in this song was brilliant. The, yeah. the fact that they gave them like 20 seconds, right, to, to do their thing. Yeah. So it, do you think it would be a hit today? Hell no. <laughs> not no yeah i agree it would not be a hit today it would be no it would not though music sucks today um pop music sucks today um by and large it's I don't, a lot I, of forgettable know, stuff i would say i don't know that it sucks any more than it sucked in 1985 or 75 for that matter you know i mean it's but it's just a, a completely different world i mean yeah, it's it not really world. is yeah you're right it's, it's a young person's and world. i think i mean it god i'm fascinated we're getting far afield here but like 
there's music that would never, ever, ever made it anywhere in my era and your era. Things like uh, Gangnam Style by Psy, this guy from Korea who had this completely bizarre song and an even more bizarre but amazing video and became a massive hit and spawned all these songs that kind of sounded just like it. it had that same big explosion sound. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that would have never made it, you know? And there's a lot of examples of that stuff that was, uh, you know, Lil Nas, who I think now just goes by Nas, uh, Old Town Road. He recorded that in his, like his sister's kitchen, I think, you know, it's like that would have never become a hit in the earlier days. So I think there's a ton of really interesting music out there being made, but we just, it can't be tracked or charted since you don't really buy music anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't go to the record it's, store. Yeah, it's it's much harder to figure out what's really resonating with people. Uh, and then also the fact that now, because you don't buy anything, you can kind of get, and you can get anything you want. You know I mean, like if you hear a snippet of a song somewhere, you listen to Shazam, you know, that mm-hmm. internet, uh, mm-hmm. that, the phone app, you go, oh, what this, it might be from 1936. Right. And you can pull it up on your phone and listen to it. Good luck when you and I were kids. If you wanted to hear from 1936, a song from 1936, you'd have to go to grandma's house, pull out a 78, find a 78 player that still worked, had a working needle to listen to it. It was a different world. So, I mean, I think there's really interesting things being made out there today. And I think it's completely conceivable that in 30 years, they'll look back and go, God, the 2020s were this incredible time for music when people were able to exchange files and you know, they may change the copyright laws, so you can't really do that the same at some point. You know, we could be, for all we know, we're living in some sort of a musical heyday, and we don't even know it. Yeah, true. I, I, but on this song, yeah, definitely a uh, production of its time. Yep. Writers of its time, singers of its time, instruments of its time. Oh, it, yeah. it would not be a hit today, but, you know, hey, they had the machine working in 1985. Um, so I hope you enjoyed our little ride with We Built This City, what many people think is the worst song of all time. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, we'll, we, uh, we'll see about that, but, um, we hope we've explained to you how the fuck that was a hit. And on behalf of Tim Foster and David Quintana, thank you for joining us. And, uh, again, if you guys ever have any suggestions on songs you want us to cover, just put them in the comments and thank you very much. Hey, if you like what you hear, like, and subscribe, it really means a lot. And we would love to have you coming back every week. Thank you.